This week's episode is brought to you by the Physical Attraction Podcast. Physical Attraction is a podcast that explores science, technology, and the future. They're currently in the midst of a series about apocalyptic scenarios and alternates between interviewing expert guests and exploring individual topics like AI, artificial intelligence, and climate change. If this sounds like the kind of thing you'd enjoy, visit their website at www.physicspodcast.com. Follow at PhysicsPod on Twitter or subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you got our show. A podcast where we talk to smart people, but not necessarily done by smart people. That is an awesome question. This one goes down probably on one of my top five. Hey, I like nutrition. I like to eat food. This is the coolest thing ever. We're going to do this forever. I wish I paid more attention in that class. You know, I'm going to be honest. I don't understand that. As a man, I just, I don't get it. Welcome to smartpeoplepodcast.com. Hello and welcome to Smart People Podcast, conversations that satisfy your curious mind. Chris Stemp here. Thanks for tuning in. Well, we said we were going to start covering this topic. You know, when we were talking about what's to come in 2018, we really wanted to make sure we brought some cutting edge information to the show. And this week we deliver. We are talking to one of the world's foremost thought leaders on virtual reality, Jeremy Balenson. Jeremy is the founding director of Stanford University's Virtual Human Interaction Lab. He is also a professor at Stanford, a senior fellow at the Woods Institute for the Environment, and a faculty leader at Stanford's Center for Longevity. And what's really cool is Jeremy received his PhD in cognitive psychology And so what he really does is he is working on bringing this idea of psychology and human interaction into virtual reality, which is what it's all about. This week on the show, we'll be starting from the basics. What is virtual reality? Many of us think it's just these goggles we put on our eyes and kind of look around. And Jeremy is going to tell us what it truly is, how it's evolved, and where it's going. We also get into more complex discussions regarding things like What are the ethical implications of virtual reality? What happens when we all just become part of the matrix and we're stuck in these bubbles while companies are sucking us for our money and our blood or whatever it is they're going to need us for? And again, I don't think there's anyone better to explain all of this to us. Jeremy is also the author of the brand new book, Experience on Demand, what virtual reality is, how it works, and what it can do. So I think that about does it for this intro. Last thing I will say is, if you listen with any regularity, we'd like to hear from you. We are creating a custom group of avid listeners to learn, change, and improve. Please email us at smartpeoplepodcast at gmail.com, and we will loop you in to this exclusive group. Again, that's smartpeoplepodcast at gmail.com. Thanks so much. And here it is, your interview with Jeremy Balenson as we talk about his new book, Experience On Demand. Enjoy. All right, Jeremy. Well, I'm excited to have you on the show. Thanks for joining us. It's my pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. You know, I was just telling you how we recently had our year-end 2017 podcast, and we talked about how we wanted to learn about things like virtual reality and all of the science that goes along with it. So it's perfect to have you on. And I'd love for you to give us a little bit of background on how someone becomes really one of the foremost thought leaders in virtual reality. How'd you get there? Well, this is the funny part because how does somebody decide to dedicate their career to something that's so ridiculous? How do you become a (laughs) VR guy? Uh, For me, it was a kind of a circuitous journey that happened uh, with a lot of accidents. So my my PhD was in cognitive science in the late 1990s, and I was basically running experiments on humans uh, to figure out how they form categories, how they understand arguments, how they do reasoning, how they recognize patterns. And then I was trying to model that thought processes on using computer programs. So this was kind of the bread and butter of cognitive science. And, you know, there's two things that happen. The first is 
you know, there's a ton of people doing this work. Cogsci was a really saturated field in the late 90s. And and the second thing is, I, you know, I was good at it, but I wasn't great at it. And there were so many people that just, they woke up and this is what they wanted to do with their lives. And, and they kind of lived it and breathed it. And I was working 80 hour weeks at the time, but I, but I just wasn't loving it. So at the same time, I read a book called Neuromancer. It's this amazing science fiction novel written by William Gibson in the late uh, 1970s and it co comes out in the early 80s and this book basically envisions a future where people are networked avatars and and, and living inside of, of of what he calls the matrix and he defines uh, the term cyberspace then and you know I got really fired up to, to think about doing something different and so uh, I was lucky enough uh, in 1999 I left my field I left CogSci and I found a postdoc at UC Santa Barbara where they taught me how to build the hardware to do VR and how to do the programming to, to do the content. At the same time, I started ask, answering bigger questions about the social world, about communication, about entertainment, about education and training. And uh, it, it was a really neat place to be at that time. So, you know, imagine that you'd met me in 1999. You said, Jeremy, what do you do for a living? And I say, well, I, uh, you know, I build avatars and I study the way they change the social world uh, psychologically. Uh, I don't think I would be on this podcast then. You'd say, what? <laughs> what, the, what, what? I don't understand. Well, you know, a lot of things there. And one that jumps out to me when we talk about career paths, it's something that's always of interest on this podcast. And one thing you said when you were doing cognitive science is, you know, you were going up against people who lived it, breathed it, spent all of their time and were just incredible. Do you believe that anything we dedicate our lives to needs to be to that extent if we aspire to any greatness? Well, uh, leaving aside terms like greatness, because, you know, uh, I, I still feel like I'm uh, an imposter and, and I always am chasing uh, chasing trying to, to do better. But, you know, to me, what I talked about people in my lab, if this project you're working on, if, if it's going to be something special, it's got to be the kind of thing that when you pop awake in the morning, you're thinking about it. When you're in the shower, you're thinking about it. You know, when you're tossing and turning at four in the morning, if, if, if that happens, that's what you're thinking about. And, and for me, it's, it's, there's a, I make some of my greatest insights about the projects I'm working on happen when I'm walking my dogs or when I'm, you know, when, when I'm doing other things. So there's a, a, a constancy to, to having these projects be a part of your life, which often produces the big breaks in the project. Yeah. And given your background with the brain and the way humans think, I, I think it's uh, plenty apt to talk about this because so many of us don't have that. Right. Or so do you believe that everyone has it? They just may not have found it or that that is really something that's relegated to those who want to be or have a singular focus? I stumbled into VR in, in a, so let me tell you a little bit more about how I stumbled here because yeah. I don't want to make the narrative seem as clean as it was. Sure. And, you know, when I was doing my PhD, my main project was on uh, under, a, a mathematical model of how humans understand arguments. My second project was a project on how different cultures do reasoning in different ways where we we're studying the it's a Maya and how they formed categories about nature and comparing them to U.S. bird experts. My third project was about spatial reasoning. So I took a class from a guy named Dave Utall, and in this class I ran a few studies that showed when people choose a route, they often choose a different route from A to B than they would from B to A. This is called route asymmetry, and a lot of us do this. So when we go from home to work, we'll take one route and we'll change it up. And, and when you think rationally uh, from a distance standpoint, this is not always, uh, it's hard to understand why we do that. Long story short is i publish a few papers on spatial reasoning and how people make decisions on navigation. In 1999, when I applied to this postdoc, I actually applied to UC Santa Barbara to do to use virtual reality to understand spatial reasoning and navigation. So the uh, it was a project where with virtual reality, you can basically dissociate body movements from vision. So imagine that you're walking forward in virtual reality. You can update update the scene appropriately, or you can actually make it so that you, know, you don't see movement even though you feel it. And it's a nice tool to understand how the brain encodes distance. So I interviewed for that job. I didn't get it because there was a guy named Dave Waller who was just brilliant at this and had been doing it for, for five years and really knew the visual system and, and how the retina works. And, and that was new to me. So I didn't get that job. But during the interview, I was at a Chinese restaurant having dinner ne uh, with a group. And I sat next to Jim Blaskovich, who was a social psychologist and over beer, uh, over Chinese food. Uh, I, you know, we just kind of hit it off talking about these big social processes and what it's going to do to identity. And I get this strange phone call two weeks later from Jim. 
Tim saying, Jeremy, I've got bad news and good news for you. And the bad news is you didn't get the job you applied for. Hmm. Uh, the, the good news is if you want to become a social psychologist, come on over and work with me. And uh, it took me about two minutes to think about that. And I said, you know what, Jim, I'm coming. And it was really, had I not taken that class from David Utah and and taken that class seriously, and it was my third line of research and published that work, I would not have gotten in the door for the interview at UCSB. I wouldn't have met Jim and, you know, who knows what I've been doing. So um, you, you got to be lucky, too. One last thing before we dive into VR on this, it just hit me, but our last episode, we interviewed a, a guy really smart. I really enjoyed it. And he was talking about education and actually making the case against education. And and more so, he was talking about the burden it puts on taxpayers to fund not only high school, but much of you know post high school education and that it's lost on many people who really don't want to be there. What's interesting is, as I talked to you, obviously highly educated, how do you think education served you in a way that is now serving others? I certainly believe people need to go to school, so I'm probably in a different camp from your last speaker. <laughs> but you know, if, if what makes my path unique is it's more about the social networks within the places as opposed to you know the learning itself. Of course, the learning was critical, and I couldn't do it without having you know, learning how to program and to you know understanding the big questions about people and philosophy. Um, but for me, what makes the journey stand out is people. I mean, this when I took this class from David Utah. You know, instead of just doing the class, he said, Jeremy, that's pretty neat work. Let's try to publish it. And mm -hmm. we published it. And then, you know, uh, at UC Santa Barbara during that interview, it was sitting next to Jim and talking to him and, and, and having that conversation that really propelled it through. So for me, you know, we talk about uh, why you need to have universities. And one of them is just getting people together uh, in these contexts where, you know, it's not always about the class itself, but it's just about that learning environment. Yeah. And that was that was my take. And I, I don't want to drag you into this because what's the point? And the, we could go on for hours. His thing was and, and then we'll move on. But his thing was agree. The social aspect's amazing. Is it amazing at a cost of one hundred thousand dollars or something? What are your thoughts on that? Just given your tie to obviously uh, Stanford. So, so why don't we pivot that question into VR and how VR will change costs? That's what I like to hear. Let's do it. One of the roles I have at Stanford is I work with a provost and I'm the director, I was the director of something called the Digital Learning Forum. And this is helping Stanford rethink its online education. So if you think about one of the things Stanford University is known for, it's these MOOCs, these massive open online courses. And uh, MOOCs are basically, if you think about it, they're just these, it's a videotape of a professor. It's a 30 year old technology. Um, so it's, it's uh, I'm, we're trying to rethink how you can integrate technology to make you know the journey for Stanford students better, not only just for sending Stanford courses out to the world, but how to use technology to make it better at Stanford itself. And what I'm working on is something called field trips. Uh, and in the book, chapter eight is called reverse field trips. And it's all about uh, what I'm going to talk to you about now, which is I'm not trying to replace the classroom. And I'm actually not trying to replace field trips themselves. Because of course, if you remember, you know, how important that field trip was when you were in high school or middle school or, or in college, these labs where you actually get to do stuff, we should do those. And, and I don't want them to go away. However, I want to have a field trip every single class. I don't want it to be mm. replacing the class, but why not take five minutes, put on the virtual reality goggles and let's go to the bottom of the ocean and swim around and do a species count. Uh, let's pick up that, 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 that sea snail and look at it and examine its shell and how ocean acidification has changed it. I mean, uh, how dare anybody learn about a statue again from a two-dimensional slide. Let's walk around the statue of David and, and see it from all angles. And, and so what I've been working on is trying to think about how to make these field trips work, both from a narrative and pedagogical standpoint, and then, of course, how to make them scale out so that the right people have the hardware uh, and what are the what, what are the ways that you integrate them into classrooms. Uh, and we've learned some lessons there. But uh, so I, I, that's that's what I'm doing at Stanford. But then when you instantiate that down, and let's getting back to your economic question, once you've made one, 
the next billion copies are free. Mm -hmm. So one of the ones that we produce, we produce a number of them in my lab. One is called the Stanford Ocean Acidification Experience. Uh, and in addition to putting that in high schools and in colleges uh, and at film festivals where thousands of people get to experience and at the San Jose Tech Museum where we have a permanent booth where people come in and do it, we just put it up on Steam. Steam is basically where you download video games and, and, and virtual reality experiences and it's free on Steam. So anyone that has the Oculus Rift CV1 one in a week or two we're going to make it ready for the cv1 and anyone that has the htc vive all, both of those cost about 400 dollars, similar to a video game console can now download this and have it in their classroom or have it in their museum and and what we're doing is putting that in lots of places to allow people to have these journeys wow okay oh boy let's get into it tell us what vr is and really start from that bottom level and go into a little bit the science behind it how you view it as a medium. So virtual reality, if you've never done it before, think about instead of watching a movie, you're in the movie. And when you move your body, the scene changes. So if you turn your head around, you see stuff behind you. If you move your right hand out in front of you, you see it. There's a cycle of three technological processes. It's called tracking, rendering, and display. Tracking is a fancy word for measuring your body movements. So uh, we've got cameras that can measure if you've moved your body. Rendering is a fancy word for redrawing the scene. So if you think about humans, as long as there's been people, every time you move your body, there is a perceptual update. So if you walk closer to an object, it gets bigger. If you turn your head toward a sound, it gets louder. So in VR, you track the movement and then you render, that is redraw the sights, the sounds and the touch for the new location. You then have to do what's called display. And that's a fancy word for just replacing what your eyes see, what your ears hear and what your skin feels and sometimes what your nose smells. So you track the movement, you redraw the appropriate senses for the new location, and then you send it back to the eyes, ears, and skin. And you do that very quickly, current systems at about 90 times a second, and you do it very accurately. It's important to measure movements uh, in a way that it actually the scene updates correspond to your actual movement. So, But experientially, it's just like you're there. So when VR is done well, there's no pixels, there's no field of view, there's no goggles. It's just an experience. And the title of the book is Experience on Demand because one of the take-home messages is that when we look at what happens in the mind and sometimes uh, when we look at brain science and physiology, the brain tends to treat a VR experience as if it were real. In other words, if you have an event in VR, think of it more as an actual experience than a media experience in terms of how it the, the, and how the brain treats it. A couple of things there. First, you know, you mentioned this idea of how the brain treats it. And I read either in your book or about your book, VR effectively blurs the lines between reality and illusion. That on its face seems terrifying. It almost seems like the bad is going to outweigh the good. Now, I don't have any deeper thought. It's just the first thing my brain says. Tell me, is that the case? And if not, why? VR is a medium, just like the written word, just like an audio file, just like a video. And it's going to be used for good, and it's going to be used for applications that are not that good. Um, you know, it's funny. The book has been reviewed in, in a lot of places, and uh, the New York Times reviewed it, and, and, and Nature Magazine reviewed it, and both of them – criticized me for being too optimistic. They really, both both have said, it's a great book, we loved it, but I wish Balancin would, would talk more about the downsides of VR. And, and, you know, chapter two is called You Are What You Eat, and it's all about the problems with VR and the problems with VR, uh, you know, they're, I'm not trying to say they're not going to be there. Well, you know, think about addiction when social networking feels like the best party you've ever been to, when online gambling feels like you're in Las Vegas, when pornography feels like sex. How are we going to ever leave the house? Uh, you know, for me, you talked about reality blurring, but there's a there's a shorter term concern, which is simply being so distracted that you smash into things. Uh, we just had, uh, sadly, our first death in virtual reality, uh, our first death that I'm aware of. Uh, a man in Russia was playing a immersive video game and fell into a plate glass table uh, and instead of going right to the hospital, tried to play the game a little bit more and bled to death. What? So, you know, there's going to be, you know, as scary as that sounds, you know, if you were to go back in time and say, would people drive while typing a device, you would say, no, they would never do that. And so one of the things that I do and, and why I, I love coming on podcasts like this is I get to say, listeners, 
please do not drive while wearing a head-mounted display. And what I'm trying to do, because I do spend a lot of time in Silicon Valley talking to, you know, the big tech companies at the highest levels. I was just at at arguably the biggest company in the VR space. Uh, I won't name the company. And I had all of their VR team, there's about 100 people in a room. And I said, please, I was looking at the engineering wing. There's 50 brilliant engineers sitting there. And I said, please, can you make it from a hardware standpoint? Forget software. Can you make it so that a virtual reality goggle does not work in a moving car? Just make it so it doesn't work. Literally, it can't work. Um, and, I, you know, got some, you know, I don't want to say nods, but at least I think I got them thinking. But it's, it's, it's to, to me, the distraction aspect is, is I worry about that even more than your concern, which was reality blurring, which is not knowing if something happened in the real world or the physical world. Uh, to me, it's the distraction thing that I'm worried about most. Right. And as you were saying the thing about not being able to operate it while driving, I kind of think of I, this is a, a stretch, but it just came to me something like the nuclear bomb. Right. So it was nuclear technology was supposed to save the world from everything, from energy, you know, and, and it'll be abundant free energy. And in the same token, it can be this incredible weapon, but it's like only use it sparingly. And then, of course, the U.S. to date, the only ones that have used it. So I feel like once we unleash something like virtual reality headsets, you might have one company that says it won't work while driving, but then you'll have somebody else who just turns it on. It's almost inevitable that these things are going to happen. I mean, if you if you follow the trajectory of augmented reality, which is uh, for our listeners that haven't done that, that's you have normal glasses that let light in from the real world and you overlay a digital image to it. So that experientially you could be walking around the street and you could see little signs hanging over cars or, or stores to tell you more about them. And, you know, when you look at the big companies that are making these glasses, when you read their, vi when you watch their promo videos, you see helping you fix a sink and, and doing, you know, math projects in the air with your children. And then when you actually build it, what they do is something called Pokemon Go, mm -hmm. uh, which was a video <laughs> game that, uh, you know, you chase around the world, finding these little Pokemons. And, uh, you know, that that's, you know, I, for the, the, you know, people love what they love and it's really hard to predict use cases that's uh one of the one of the stories we tell in the book was you know Wozniak was talking about uh when he and Jobs founded Apple and uh when when they created the you know the first personal computer you know they had a very specific set of expectations what it was going to be used for they thought it was going to be uh used for certain things and 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 when people started using spreadsheets at home and and it, it was just a very different use case and that they hadn't predicted uh even you know arguably the smartest pair of minds to be in the tech space ever uh it's hard to predict what people are going to do with stuff yeah actually great analogy or example with the pokemon go just like you said are we continuing to innovate in a way that just serves the human and the human itself is the flawed boring or lazy creature that's going to use it in the least impactful way well why don't we can take a step back and talk about what the market is funding right now. In other words, what are people actually paying to do in VR? And so one of the things that I've done, I run an academic lab at Stanford. I've co-founded a company called Striver and Striver uses VR for training. And if you think about training, why do we use VR? Go back to the flight simulator. So in the late 1920s, Edwin Link decided he wanted to learn how to fly, but he didn't want to do it from a manual. Now, when we learn, we learn by doing, and we learn by making mistakes and getting feedback. That's just how the learning process works. Doing that in a plane is very expensive, right? You lose lives, you lose planes. It's a bad idea to, to have a novice fly a plane, hence the simulator. It's the best of both worlds. It feels like you're doing something, but no one gets hurt and you can practice for free. And where, where we started with Striver was training uh, National Football League quarterbacks and college quarterbacks in American football. And the quarterback, when he goes up to the line of scrimmage, he's got to look around and recognize a pattern that is the, the defense. So he's got to do pattern recognition by turning his head back and forth. He's then got to make a decision. The decision is, do you keep the original play or do you change the play or just either, uh, the, either of the plays that you're going to switch to? And then you've got to communicate that decision to the rest of the team. So to sum that up, recognize a pattern, make a decision, communicate that decision. And what we uh, discovered in the 2014 season at Stanford was that 
this was a great tool. Quarterbacks were improving their decision making. They're reducing the reaction time. And our coach, David Shaw, and our quarterback, Kevin Hogan, uh, both they claim that I would never claim this. I would just repeat them that this was a tool that helped them have a, a, an exceptionally good season. Derek graduates. Derek Belch, who's the graduate student that that did the thesis for the Stanford team, he graduates January 2nd, uh, 2015 forms this company called Striver, and to everyone's surprise, in three months, Derek signs five NFL teams to multi-year contracts in the first couple months. And uh, since then, it's just been this wild ride where you're actually seeing a use case that is helping people. And the neat thing is, of course, there's many, many athletes that are using this across all sports, um, German national football team, the U.S. Olympic ski team, NBA teams. Uh, there, there's a lot of action in the sports. But that pattern that I just talked about, that process of recognizing a pattern, making a decision, and then communicating that to others, it turns out just about everyone in their job has to do that. And as of today, I can announce that we have trained over 150,000 Walmart employees using virtual reality to get better at their jobs. And so, you know, imagine that it's your first day at Walmart, and it just happens to be the day after Thanksgiving. We call this holiday rush or some people call it Black Friday, Walmart calls it Holiday Rush, and there's people everywhere all around you and they're upset and they're running and they're you know, getting in your space and how do you, how do you handle that and, and what are the coping strategies you have and what are you supposed to say? And so what we've been doing with Walmart is imagine uh, that scenario or you're working at a deli counter and there's, there, there's a safety violation, you've gotta find it, look around. It's just, it's just a better way to learn your job as opposed to reading it from a handbook and it's just, it's just a really neat tool that people are actually using. This week's episode of Smart People Podcast is brought to you by Audible. Audiobooks are great for helping you be a better you, whether you want to feel healthier, get motivated, or learn something new. And with an unmatched selection of audiobooks, original audio shows, news, comedy, and more, Audible has all the audio content you need to start your year on the right foot. If you're like Chris and I, you always want to be learning something new or learning how to be more successful, Try books like Braving the Wilderness, Daily Self-Discipline, The Power of Habit, Grit, How to Be a Boss. We could go on and on. There's so much to try. Just give it a shot. Whether it's on your phone, through your car, from a tablet, or at home on an Amazon Echo, you can get through tons of books while doing almost anything. And Audible even lets you switch seamlessly between devices, picking up exactly where you left off. So start learning today. Start your 30-day trial and get your first audiobook free. Go to audible.com slash smart or text smart to 500-500. Again, that's audible.com slash smart or text smart to 500-500 for a 30-day trial and a free first audiobook. You can do it with audiobooks. And now back to the episode. One of the things that really brought me around more to VR is the story about, I think I saw it on YouTube, but they were using it as a way of fundraising when they were going to talk with, I guess it was wealthy individuals or, or organizations about really poor places in third world countries. And they were giving them these VR sets and allowing them to walk alongside these really poor villages and, and see what a day in the life is like and, and experience it. That that was really a paradigm shift for me in the ability to help us empathize. Chapter three of the book is called Walking in the Shoes of Another. And in that chapter, I review every single study that's ever been done in the history of using virtual reality to increase empathy. A lot of it is work out of my lab. There's also great work by a group out of Barcelona with Mel Slater's team. And there's a lot of research that says if you give someone an experience, you have them become someone else. They actually look down and they see their arms. They've changed skin color or they you you look down and you are older or you're a different gender. You really feel what it's like to be someone else. And you can actually, the neuroscientists have traced the, the mechanism here, they call it body transfer, where when you move your body around and, and you see yourself move with you in a mirror or looking down from the first person, the brain actually accepts that 3D model of an avatar of you 
as part of the self. So the self scheme expands so that you really feel like this body is yours. Uh, then what you do is you have someone experience some traumatic event. They they feel, you know, prejudice or they feel uh, discrimination or they feel, you know, uh, even sometimes physical assault if you want to uh, study that or to give someone that experience. And I know that sounds intense, but we read about this all the time and you see videos when you walk a mile in someone else's shoes. What our, what our research has shown is that, uh, look, it's not a magic bullet. It doesn't solve every single problem problem and it's not nothing solves prejudice it's, it's but what we've demonstrated is that when you compare a VR experience of becoming someone and you compare that to watching a video or doing role play imagination or reading about case studies that this experience of becoming someone else and experiencing prejudice firsthand uh, that changes attitudes and behaviors more com than control conditions wow it's that's really an incredible tool i think to do so and when we talk about virtual reality do you envision it to always be the goggles and the gloves or is the term always tied to a certain hardware? There is a large and growing movement, especially in the venture capital community that's supporting something called light field capture and light field display. And basically there's a way that you can create a pattern of light in a room that would exist had light bounced off an object. So the way you see a lamp, light comes from the sun or from a light and some of the wavelengths uh, get absorbed by that lamp some get reflected uh, there's a pattern of light that exists in the room because light has reflected refracted and been absorbed by that lamp now with enough computers and enough filters that can redirect the patterns of light to create a field of light you can actually see 3D models without having any glasses on your head at all. This is called light field display, and there's a lot of energy in the space right now. In my lab, we've got uh, a nice light field display where you actually walk in the waiting room to my lab, and you can see objects just kind of floating around in the room. It's it's, it's called a lenticular display, and it's a different way of doing light fields. It's it's a bit more limited, but when people come in, they're they're blown away by it. So the future, you know, if we talk about the hero Jaron Lanier, uh, who coined the term virtual reality, and and you know built arguably the first, you know, networked avatar system 20 years ago, you know, Jaron always says VR is going to fail miserably if you have to have a gazillion dollar room uh, or if you have to put stuff on your face. And I think that the smart energy is going towards trying to figure out how to give someone a VR without any goggles at all. I just have to unscramble my brain for a second. I mean, this is the type of shift that people are wondering when, if, what's going to happen. Uh, when we are creating environments that our brain thinks are real and they are a light model, what what's going to happen? A, a good way or bad way? I mean, what do you think the biggest changes are going to be in, you know, if you could see maybe 20 to 25 years into the future as it relates to virtual reality and how we live our lives? So we are, I, I like to always answer those questions by talking about data. And one thing my lab is doing is to, triple down our academic research on augmented reality. And we're running a study right now that imagine two people are having a conversation and one person, one of those two people is wearing augmented reality glasses. That person sees a third person in the room projected on the glasses that only she can see. So if you're following this, there's two people sitting across the table physically. One of them has augmented reality glasses. And then there's a third person that's networked into the conversation that only that person with the glasses can see. How does that change the conversation between the first two people? And, you know, it's we just tried this. We literally just tried this yesterday, meaning we got the networking working. And I was sitting there with my graduate student and we were having a conversation. He had the goggles on and there was he was non-verbally interacting with a person that I couldn't see who was in the room with me. And we just didn't know how to function. I, I, so, what we're, so what we're studying is how does the world change when all of a sudden there's people in the room that not everybody can see, yeah. but they're there. Is that going to just short circuit our brain and we just can't well, well, function? So, so let me tell you about the good use case. I mean, we, it's fun to talk about the mind bending stuff and, and, yeah, and that that, that's why it's, that's why it's great to be a professor because you get to do that for fun. <laughs> exactly. And it's great. Uh, the home run application here is if I can make it so that, you know, this, what I call social presence or what the field calls social presence is, you know, feeling as if that avatar is really there. If I can make that interaction, you know, there's a reason why video conference is okay, but it's not going to replace important work meetings. If I can make it really feel as if that person is there and eye contact works and body posture works in the right way, then we've just 
eliminated the need to commute to work. Now, not every day, because you need social contact, you need that water cooler, and, I, and I, I'm supportive of that, but how many people get in a box, dr drive for an hour behind a bunch of other people in boxes, get to work, and then sit at a computer, clack all day, and do the same thing back? And you know, if we can get rid of that commute, think of the productivity of time we've saved, think of the amount of fossil fuels we've saved, think of the, the road rage we've gotten rid of, germs from public transportation. You know, you should still travel to meet your loved ones, to go to parties, and even to work for really important meetings, but not every meeting is that important. And we've just solved climate change if we've gotten rid of the commute. That's a great example, specifically because oftentimes in my presentations that I do, I'll talk about how there was a great study that said one of the worst experiences we go through is commuting. And so if you could eliminate that, I think it would increase the overall happiness of a lot of people on top of all the things you mentioned. However, as you mentioned, we don't need to go to the office. And if that becomes a reality, essentially, we won't need to move. I always think back to, and you mentioned the matrix earlier, is this just one step closer to us being blobs in an egg shaped uh, structure with a liquid that sustains us as our brain experiences things from all over the galaxy? You know, I'm a firm believer that people are people and we like to go outside and do things. And I, I, I that I'm with virtual reality. Let's forget augmented reality for a second. With virtual reality, we have a 20 minute rule in my lab. Um, it, after 20 minutes, take it off, walk around. Mm -hmm. And more often than not, people don't really want to go back in. There's just not that much reason to be in VR for longer than that. VR is really good for these short bursts. And and I spend a lot of time in the Valley with the companies that are producing VR and the content and, and even the video games. And I'm not saying that there aren't games that people play for longer. There's a couple of them and there's a tiny proportion of people that do spend that amount of time, you know, hours as opposed to, to minutes. Um, but more often than not, you see someone go into VR, do something that is intense and crazy and that they couldn't do in the real world. And then they don't go back in after, you know, it's after uh, 10 minutes, 15 yeah. minutes. It's not a, it's not a everyday thing. It's not a all day long thing. So uh, I, I, I'm not as concerned as, as, as some are about this kind of, we're all going to become pod people matrix <laughs> vision. Um, but you know, that being said, I'm wrong every day. So, <laughs> well, as you mentioned that I was thinking about how are our other senses impacted by virtual reality. So what's the current state of the technology as it relates to things like smells and touch as opposed to just sight? And also, where do you think that's going? So when you line up the senses, uh, sight and sound, we are doing, uh, we're very aggressive on, the, we being the field, we are, we, 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 the images look great, the update rate is quick, uh, the uh, resolution is quite good. Sound, we can, if you have earphones on, we can do spatialized sound so that if a bird flies by, the sound follows the bird. Um, for touch, um, to do really accurate touch, for example, if you grab one hand with the other and squeeze it, I'm doing that right now, and feel the nuance and the pressure that you can do just by grabbing your own hand, it's really hard to do that type of touch. And I don't mm -hmm. see that changing anytime soon. If there's so much, so many subtleties in the muscle movements and in the amount of forces, is, is, it would require a device the size of a car. So the field is settled on for touch just uh, – a little bit of vibration. Actually, let me tell you the experience I had yesterday regarding touch. Uh, there's a company called High Fidelity. High Fidelity, uh, if you know, if, if you remember Second Life, uh, Second Life was the networked avatar space that that's still around and thriving. Actually, still has many many users that go in there quite often. But uh, during the heyday, it was a, it was a very popular thing for the media to talk about. Anyway, their CEO Philip Rosedale, his new company is called High Fidelity, and it's Second Life, but in immersive VR, where you're wearing the goggles and you've got hand controllers and what I did yesterday, uh, they had this big event for the press where uh, it was a dance party where there was 30 people in a huge warehouse where everybody had full body tracking, arms and legs, and you were dancing and listening to music networked into the same virtual reality dance club. And I was wearing this vest, and this vest had uh, some number, uh, more than a dozen uh, pressure points where you could feel your the vibration and the vest would, would move as a way so that you'd basically feel touch and pressure against your chest. And what experientially that was is somebody virtually walked up to me, came up to me in the dance floor, moved their avatar's hand so that I saw their fingers in VR reach towards my chest. When they were rubbing their hand up and down my chest and on my back, I would feel the vibrations in my back and chest using this this haptic vest. It was unbelievable. Wow. I, it, 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 was, it was just unbelievable. What about smell? 
my guess is the the real evolution is going to be just triggering the brain to imagine it's smelling something. So we just uh, published our first study using virtual scent. Uh, it, it came out about two, three weeks ago in a journal called Presence, which is the, the big VR journal. Um, we built virtual donuts. And the big idea here is let's take a step back. Imagine that you were eating a vegan patty and it looked smelled and felt in your hands via touch like the best hamburger you'd ever had in your life. We've just solved two things, climate change because of all of the deforestation that goes with the cattle industry and the obesity epidemic in the United States. So the big idea, take a step back, is if we can make taste occur virtually through scent, touch, and sight, then we've solved a really important problem. So the study that we ran had people, so experientially, imagine that you look down and in VR, you're moving your hands and you saw a donut in your hand, okay? What we varied experimentally, half the subjects felt a donut. We actually put a plastic donut in their hand. The other half didn't feel a donut. And then half the subjects smelled the donut. We used a olfactory device to actually put donut scent in their nose. The other half didn't smell the donut. So everybody saw the donut, but some people felt it in their hands, others didn't, and some people smelled it and others didn't. Now, because this was the first study, we had two competing hypotheses here. One was satiation, which is you just, you, you'd feel like you ate this donut and you wouldn't feel like you needed it again. The other was priming, which is, boy, I just really got reminded of donuts and I'm going to go eat a bunch of them. After the study, we, we had a taste test where they actually got to eat real donuts. And what we discovered, and this is very preliminary, there's about 100 subjects in the study, you know, there needs to be dozens more before we, we can say this authoritatively. What we found in a preliminary first test was evidence for satiation, that feeling the donut and smelling the donut actually caused you to eat fewer donuts later on. So do you think do you think it's possible to do that scent in a different way? I mean, where will it be in 10 years if we're trying to modify the senses? Yeah, so uh, your intuition is right on. So with sight and sound, when you present it to someone in VR, you can actually remove it really quickly. So with, with vision uh, on computer screens, we've got something called a frame rate, and we, we update most screens at 90 frames a second, and at frame 52, when you remove an image, it's gone. And by frame 53, you can do something different. The same thing with sound. Uh, sound waves dissipate very quickly. Scent is a different thing, though. So if there's a, a bird that flies by your nose, and it's a stinky bird, mm. and when the bird gets right under your nose, you squirt out a bunch of scent for the bird, mm. when the bird's gone, it's very hard to get that scent out of there. Uh, you can use fans and stuff, but it's very difficult. So which, what you're suggesting is some kind of a direct brain connection. We call this BCI, brain computer interface. And, you know, I don't know for five years or 10 years or 20, obviously there's a lot of smart people working on the problem. Uh, it's a very different type of a solution than and when we go again to the Bible, uh, Neuromancer by William Gibson. That's, uh, that, that's how it was just depicted in that novel. Interesting. Okay, well, now I want to talk to talk about what is currently available to the average consumer? Because my producer is is a technophile. He loves this stuff. And he was saying, you know, look, VR is really good. You can go get it. And I said, well, then why isn't it everywhere? And he was like, maybe it is. And you just don't know. Uh, I'm interested in it if it's worth my time and money, especially when you were talking about things like uh, being able to download some of this content from Stanford and explore the ocean and then maybe doing it with my son when he gets older what what would you recommend like what's out there right now that's great and what is coming in the near future so uh in terms of the great i will say i was just at facebook and and i signed an nda but they did allow me to say what i'm about to say mm -hmm. and i don't work for them by the way i just mm -hmm. i just i just went there for a book talk and it was fun i tried their new head mount display called the santa cruz and boy, is it special. It is, uh, it's really, really good. It's not ready yet. So I wouldn't uh, rush out to stores yet to get that because it's, it'll be coming out probably in about six months, mm -hmm. but I've seen the future and the future is special. Um, for, for the current, you know, what, what I tell people that I haven't tried VR is before you buy it for the home, I suggest you go try it in a place where it can be perfect. And so there's, a, there's a, a growing movement called location based VR. This is basically a fancy word for an arcade. Uh, and there's a great company in, in, in San Rafael here in California called Nomadic. Nomadic uh, has this amazing arcade where you're it's a backpack system and you're running around and it's there's drones and your feet, all sorts of objects you can grab. And that's really neat. Uh, we just did a NPR piece for uh, the weekend edition where Lulu Garcia Navarro took us to VR World. 
and VR World is an arcade uh, on the corner of 34th Street and 5th Avenue in New York City. And uh, I can't tell you how special this was. There was a, a hundred kids running around on field trips and they were putting on high-end HTC Vive systems, which is one of the great ones, and high-end Oculus uh, CV1 systems, and they are having a ball. So uh, the problem with putting it in the home is twofold. One is if the tracking equipment, remember tracking equipment measures your physical movements, isn't perfect, then the experience is going to be off. And you want someone just that can really make sure it's calibrated the right way so so that the experience is, is, is good. The second thing is content. It's hard to find the right content. There's a lot of content out there that's mediocre, and you want someone that's really curating that for you. And so uh, my advice to listeners would be start by going to an arcade, to a museum, somebody that is going to make it perfect for you. Uh, and, you know, I... I you know, look, I have a six-year-old daughter and a three-year-old daughter, and of course I have a VR system in my backpack all the time because that's <laughs> what I do for a living. Um, I don't use it at all at home for fun, and my daughter, I've let her use, my six-year-old, I've let use it four times in her life for maybe about two minutes a pop. So, wow. you know, I, I, I don't, I'm not... I'm not sure listeners need to go out and buy one for the home. Mm. I think you should go try it, though. It's awesome. Hmm. Yeah, I love that. That's a great way to end it. Well, Jeremy, I've really appreciated it. And again, the book is Experience on Demand, what virtual reality is, how it works, and what it can do. And I want to ask you to tell our listeners, what what else is covered in this book that you think will excite or entice or just inform if this is a topic that we're interested in? The book is written for the smart person that keeps hearing this word virtual reality and, you know, kind of knows what it is, but just wants to know more. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, things, questions like, how old should my child be before I let her go in? And uh, what kind of experiences should I do versus shouldn't I do? And, uh, you know, with uh, what, what, what I tried to do in the book is to tell stories. And the neat thing about being, you know, at Stanford for the last 15 years in the heart of Silicon Valley is that there's a lot of fun things that have happened. So we talk about, you know, heads of state that come to the lab to learn about should we make this part of their education system and CEOs of the biggest companies that are trying to figure out, you know, should they invest their time and resources in it. And so it's, it's, it's in some ways, it's a history of the last five years of this consumer revolution to kind of talk about how, you know, how Silicon Valley has ported this thing out and should it really be there? And, and you know, you, you, you get from the way that I talk, I'm not a VR evangelist. Uh, I don't sure. have a Facebook account. I don't play video games. I, I, it's, 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 I don't do social networking. I do, you know, some Twitter for work purposes. And so I'm not a let's all go out and use technology all the time guy. What I recommend VR for are very special experiences. And you cover a number of them in the book, which is really fascinating. Last thing real quick I wanted to ask you is how do we get rich off of VR? What should I go invest in? What, what do you recommend? Stocks, companies, what, what, do you, what are you doing? If I knew that, I'd be rich too. Ah, oh, come on. You got to know some extent. Okay. You don't have to give us a company, but like, what are the monetary implications of VR going to yeah, be? So, so, so I'm not trying to be difficult here. Sure. I, you know, I just, I just spoke at a conference that had five, it was the Cayman Alternative Investment Summit and it was 500, you know, East Coast investors um, from the best of the best places that, you know, came to hear about weird technologies. And, and my advice to them was, if you're going to invest in a VR company, try to find a problem it's going to solve as opposed to blindly putting money into the tech for its own sake. Mm -hmm. So going back to Striver, which again, full disclosure, it's a company I co-founded. Mm -hmm. Striver is succeeding. We're now 70 employees and uh, we have a big announcement coming up in the next week or two uh, about uh, how we're going to grow quite largely, quite bigly uh, very soon. Um <laughs> The reason Striver is doing well is because we didn't start by saying, let's throw VR at everything. When I told you about that Walmart example, you know, there's a guy named Logan who read every word probably a dozen times of the, the Walmart training handbook. And of the thousands of things we could train in VR, we only pulled out 10 of them. Uh, and just to start, and those 10 things that really leverage VR, leverage having to look around a room and leverage this arousal that you get from being in an intense situation. And so my advice to, to, to people is find things like that where you're not using VR just because it's there. You're, you're, you're finding a problem that it solves inherently and actually that leverages what makes the VR experience special. Absolutely. Fantastic. Well, again, Jeremy, your book is Experience on Demand. Fantastic. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks for being on Smart People Podcast. Uh, this is a real treat and uh, looking forward to the next time. Absolutely. All right. Have a good one. You too. All right. Bye-bye.
Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Jeremy Balinson. Jeremy's book, Experience on Demand, What Virtual Reality Is, How It Works, and What It Can Do, can be found at your local bookstore and on Amazon. And as always, if you decide to purchase the book through Amazon, please use our Smart People Podcast Amazon link located at smartpeoplepodcast.com slash Amazon. As always, any purchase you make through the link comes at no extra cost to you, but it does greatly help support the show. If you'd like other free and easy ways to support the show, head over to iTunes or Apple Podcasts and leave a rating and review over there. If you'd like to reach out to the show, you can email us at smartpeoplepodcast at gmail.com or message us on Twitter at smartpeoplepod. Don't forget to head over to smartpeoplepodcast.com where you can check out all of the old episodes and sign up for the newsletter if you're interested. Make sure you stay tuned because we've got a lot of great interviews coming up and we will see you all next episode.